Hey guys, in this video, we're going to motivate the basic intuition behind uh, linear regression analysis. So I figured like the best uh, medium or platform in order to be able to do this is to do this within our markdown because within our markdown, I'm able to integrate different components of not only just the actual calculations behind what we're after, but also at the same time, I can type out some, some math type and hopefully help uh, clear up some of the notation or uh, calculation portions of this. So I've basically just opened up our studio and I'm going to go over here to file, new file and hit uh, R markdown. And if you already have R markdown installed, then you're going to get this kind of splash screen. If not, then you're going to be asked to uh, download some packages. And then after it downloads some packages, you'll eventually get this. So I'm going to put in a title for this document and I'm just going to say uh, basic linear regression. And I'm going to make the output file an HTML file. Now, as soon as this happens, it automatically generates some uh, some basic uh, formatting stuff. This is just some filler uh, information. I'm going to take everything except this first uh, line of commands, and I'm just going to delete it uh, and get rid of it. And so then as we move through this document, I'll add new things. And, and if you have any questions as to how I get certain formatted things, by all means, just shoot me a, a, a comment and we can go from there. All right, so the first thing you see in, uh, inside of an R markdown is what's referred to as the Weimel header. So it gives you the title, author, date, and this will all, all be pre-formatted based on the actual information that you, you put here. The next uh, few lines, you'll see uh, a kind of specially formatted section here from line eight to line 10 uh, with some accent lines. These are accents, uh, so they're located just below the escape key, not the actual uh, single quote, uh, which is located near the enter or the return key. Uh, so I'm going to leave this uh, m m uh, command here that says basically the default setting is to print all of your R code inside the document because for this purpose we're going to want that. But I'm also going to uh, add some uh, additional packages that we're going to want. So I'm going to uh, do ggplot2 uh, and then I'm also going to uh, do another package, uh, stargazer, which I'll eventually need for um, uh, summarizing some regression output. Great. Uh, so after that, uh, I'm going to put a header here and I'm just going to put uh, intuition. So the headers are usually uh, denoted after a hashtag uh, symbol. Uh, normally this hashtag would comment something out within R, but in R markdown it doesn't. It actually um, follows according to basic markdown uh, rules rather than R rules. So this will actually give me a header after that first uh, pound sign. All right. So Basically, what are we after with uh, with intuition or, or with regression analysis? Regression analysis is a basic way of calculating the relationships, and economics is all about relationships. Uh, and so, uh, uh, OLS, ordinary least squares regression, uh, as it's frequently called, uh, is used uh, basically to estimate relationships. So it's used to estimate relationships with data. Uh, and so we're going to work through a, a simple example uh, where we're going to build a relationship and I'm going to simulate the data for this relationship and then we're going to actually use linear regression analysis to estimate uh, the this relationship that we already have kind of baked in into our assumptions and we're going to build in some degree of randomness to it so that our results are not going to quite perfectly align but they're going to be relatively close to that. So the first, uh, in order to, to really specify this, I'm going to use uh, this kind of uh, double dollar sign environment. And what this will do is this will actually create an equation within our markdown, but it'll kind of give a preview of that equation as well. So we're gonna use a very simple uh, regression where we're gonna say the number of hours that an individual can study is gonna be equal to some constant, and we'll call this constant uh, uh, beta zero. Now here we have to, uh, I, I want to at least uh, note something here as you're typing out uh, subscripts, you use that underscore uh, for a subscript. If it is just a single letter, you can actually not use the curly braces. So I can actually just put zero there, uh, excuse me. Um, and, uh, and it will, um, it'll go ahead and do that. But if I have anything additional there, let's say, I don't know if this were also uh, I, 
then it doesn't work. But if I put all of that within curly braces, then all of that becomes a subscript. So just be, be aware of, of that. If you have a more complicated subscript, uh, you may not want to do that. Um, you get the idea. All right, so uh, great. So we have some constant uh, term in there, some uh, some intercept, if you will, in this relationship. And then we're, uh, we have a, a slope term that we're going to call beta 1. And this is going to be motivated or multiplied by the number of cups of coffee that someone drinks, which, ooh, by the way, coffee. Mm. Oh, that's good. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, so basically someone drinks coffee, they get highly caffeinated or energy drinks, however you prefer. And, uh, and, and, and as a result of that, they, um, yeah, that, um, gives them a little additional boost of energy and they're able to study a little bit harder. And then of course there's some degree of randomness. So we're going to put an error term here and I'm just going to call that E for error term. And that error term is going to be kind of individual for, um, uh, it's going to be some amount that's, that's, is specific to some individual. So this relationship is going to gov be governed on average over all of our individuals. It's not going to be a perfect representation of every single individual. Some individuals, uh, they're going to exhibit uh, diminishing returns to scale. So if you have, I don't know, four or five cups of coffee, all of a sudden you really start feeling crappy and you're not focusing in enough. And the next thing you know, you're not going to be able to study nearly as many hours. So uh, you get that idea. So you, you have some notion here that there is some degree of error attached to this. And this error, individual error term is going to be different for, for any given individual. It's not going to be a perfect relationship. Now, I'm going to take this whole uh, line 18 through 20, and I'm just going to copy it. And I'm going to paste it down here below this. Uh, and when I do that, um, hmm. There we go. I have to, you have to give it a second for the formatting to kind of go away. I'm going to change these, and I want to go ahead and assume something. So I'm going to assume a, a constant term of uh, three, might as well, and uh, and three as well for our slope term. So basically, what we're saying here is, if someone drinks no coffee, then the amount uh, of the amount of the uh, observation within coffee I is zero. Zero multiplied by three is zero. We expect this on average. Uh, this error term to be zero on average. For some people, it's not going to be. For some people, it'll be positive. For some people, it'll be negative. Uh, but on average, it's going to be zero. And so then what we're effectively saying is when someone drinks no coffee, then what is the expected number of hours they can study unaided? Well, it's three. It's the, it's the first, it's the intercept. So that intercept kind of represents then what is the expectation of our dependent variable, in this case, hours, when our independent variable, in this case, the number of cups of coffee one drinks is equal to zero. It's our unconditional uh, average uh, given no other uh, additional X's or re exogenous regressors. Then, of course, as we introduce more exogenous regressors, then that slope term kind of comes into play here. And so, in, in theory, these X's become very, very important to explaining our dependent variable number of hours that one person can study. Great. So uh, now let's take this relationship and let's code this. So I'm going to insert specifically an R chunk into this so that we can start to kind of code some of this within R and give it something to play with. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. You can actually remember some key commands. If you're, uh, I, I believe if, if I remember correctly, it's uh, control alt I for PC. It's command option I for for a Mac. If you don't remember those, you can go to this insert button here and you can actually insert uh, a few different uh, kinds of code here. These will format this kind of code. R will actually um, uh, give you code that, that will run within R Markdown. So uh, what it does is it creates this kind of, uh, it's a, an environment similar to your equation environment. Notice you'll see the, the accent lines and a curly brace for R kind of denoting, okay, this is R code. And then it closes with three more accent lines. If you forget, you can always type this out, but remember these are accents, not actual single quotes. So just be careful with that. All right, so the first thing, since we're going to generate some random numbers, we're going to set a seed. Uh, and so I'm just going to pick... Uh, uh, pick some uh, or some random numbers um, for that just to kind of uh, give this uh, a starting point. There are no such things as perfectly random 
numbers within a computer environment. Everything is systematized. And so uh, usually whenever you're generating random numbers in a computer, there's a really complicated and convoluted equation. And the start value for that equation usually is determined by your computer. In most instances, if you don't specify that, it's determined by your system clock. And so you'll never actually get those random, the same random numbers again, unless you set a seed, which is basically saying, I'm going to set my starting value to the same number. So by setting a seed here, we're able to all get the same result. All right, so now I'm going to specify the number of individuals uh, within my sample. And here I'm just going to pick 100. So I'll set n equal to 100. And then I'm going to uh, generate uh, some random numbers from a uniform distribution. So I'm going to use the runif function for uniform, and that's going to be equal to the number of individuals in my sample. And then I'm going to scale it up and I'm going to multiply it by five. A uniform distribution is uh, a closed um, interval distribution that's bound between zero and one, unless you actually specify, which I think there's a way to specify it with our, our uh, unif function without just multiplying by five, but it's this is probably marginally easier um, and so what it will do is actually will pick a uh, random numbers in between 0 and 1 uh, in this case because I'm multiplying it by 5 then of course I'm, I'm going to just be scaling it upwards all right now we're going to simulate our dependent variable and in this case I want only absolute value because I don't want anyone studying negative hours because that just absolutely doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So we use the absolute value function and then we're going to specify our actual equation. The equation specified here in lines 22 through 24. So I'm going to set that equal to 3 for our intercept um, or pardon me 3 times x which we previously did plus 3 our intercept uh, and then also plus a, a random uh, component. So I'm going to use the R norm function. And what this is going to do is it's going to generate some random numbers from a normal distribution. So this is going to be a two-tailed distribution. It's going to be centered around zero and it's going to pull positive and negative values. So some individuals this relationship is going to be overly optimistic for them and some individuals this relationship is going to be um, uh, too, too stringent. And so we want to be able to capture both sides, positive and negative uh, error terms in that regard. Uh, so we have to specify the number of um, individuals from or number of draws that'll be equal to n. Uh, we're going to set uh, a mean of zero, and then we're going to set a, a standard deviation of three. Great, and then we're going to bind all this together in a data frame. We're going to call our dependent variable coffee, and we're going to call our independent variable hours. Fantastic. So uh, this gives us all the the simulated data that we need. We have our uh, we have our, our dependent variable that we've simulated randomly uh, from our uniform distribution. We have our um, or pardon me, independent variable, our dependent variable that we've simulated uh, randomly as a function of our dependent independent variable, but also as a function of our error term. So we've captured all the different components from our actual relationship right here. We can see everything here is in line 30. Great. Now let's uh, let's plot this. So we're going to uh, I'm going to generate a new R chunk for this. And in ggplot, I want to say, all right, give me my data. And then how do we want this thing to look? The aesthetics function, we want to set x equal to coffee. And we want to set y equal to hours. We want to plot the individual points to this. So we're going to say uh, we want a gm point. I don't need to give any, any additional information there at all. And then we want to generate a regression line through here. We want to actually characterize the uh, the relationship. And so we want to set our method for this uh, smoothed line to equal to LM for linear model. So like, like an OLS regression, if you will. And then just to beautify it and make this pretty, we'll add some labels here. We're going to set X equal to uh, cups of coffee. And y equal to a uh, number of hours an econ student 
and study. Yeah, finger slip. All right, so great. Um, once we have this, now the cool thing about R Markdown is um, we have the ability to preview everything that we do here. So just in the same way that we can preview these equations here, I can hit this green button here. It will run the code above it, and then it will run this actual uh, th this chunk as well. And this will actually show up in the environment. So if we actually go over here to the environment tab, we'll see that this actually has run everything as if it were running in the console or from a script file. So everything is, is kind of behaving there. Uh, and then I can preview uh, the actual graph as well, already ready to go. So here we have our actual relationship with our generated data. We have a uh, number of cups of coffee in along the horizontal axis. And we can see since we multiplied that closed interval of 0 to 1 by 5, then we now have a closed interval of 0 to 5 for our total number of cups of coffee that are consumed. So no one in our hypothetical sample has consumed more than five cups of coffee, which at least is consistent with uh, uh, standard uh, medical advice. You shouldn't consume more than five cups of caffeinated beverage uh, within a given day, which by the way, coffee. Mm. Oh, excuse me, I just realized I misspelled my coffee label. <laughs> Let me rerun that. All right, so, uh, so great. So now we have uh, cups of coffee on the horizontal axis. We have number of hours that an individual can study on the vertical axis. I, I picked three and three because it basically guarantees that we're not going to have any crazy, uh, in, any crazy outcomes like people studying more than 24 hours in a day. Otherwise, that would just not work at all. Uh, so we can see that we have a whole bunch of randomness in terms of uh, the actual observations hanging out here. So we can see we have some differences. Uh, this person right here where the cursor is, uh, they're way off this line. This line is the best fit. If we move this line or rotate it in any way, we make things worse. And so this kind of helps to understand the intuition behind linear regression analysis. So OLS uh, fits a line of best fit through the data. Uh, any different line, any different straight line. So if we're talking like shifts in the intercept, slight tweaks in the uh, in the slope of this. Any different line produces an inferior fit. Now, uh, excuse me, I'm just talking, but I'm not typing. <laughs> That's embarrassing. All right, so any different line uh, produces an inferior fit. So what this does, uh, it, it we're picking this line based on an actual optimization problem. So uh, the line is picked by minimizing the sum of squared residuals. So I'll explain what that means when we say minimizing the sum of squared residuals. So if you take the difference between this blue line and any given point, it's either positive or negative, we square that difference so that all of them become positive, and then we add them up we get a single number. If you tweak this line and move it in any way, change the slope, change the intercept, when we redo that calculation, taking every point, subtracting that point from the line, squaring it, adding it up, we get a greater sum of squared differences. So this is what we mean by when we say a linear line of best fit. This gives us the hypothetically best solution that we can possibly have. Any other line is going to be worse off. Even if it doesn't look that way visually to us, mathematically, it will be. We'll get more into the math of this, but we can actually use this definition of minimizing the sum of squared residuals as an actual math problem. We can actually specify that as an optimization problem, and we can actually use that framework to actually solve for what this, um, 
these estimates will be the slope and this intercept uh, as a general solution. And we'll do that later. We're not gonna do that in this video, but we will definitely do that going forward. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna show what happens um, when we try to estimate this. So we're gonna introduce a new R chunk, and I'm gonna take this exact data and I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to estimate a model. So I'm going to call this model one, uh, just because I'm not feeling very creative right now. And then I'm going to run a linear regression. Uh, the function for linear regression in uh, R is called LM. This is the same LM that we used in line 38 for our geom smooth. So we're actually going to give me the, it's going to calculate the slope and the intercept of this blue line that we've plotted here. We're going to specify our uh, dependent variable, in this case hours, our independent variable coffee, and um, we're going to say the data that we want for this is going to be this dat data frame that we um, uh, previously defined. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to summarize this, and in order to summarize this, I'm actually going to use the stargazer command uh, that we've loaded here before. I'm going to put in model one for this. Uh, I'm going to set type equal to text, and then I'm going to set uh, the digits of accuracy for this um, equal to three, because I don't really care beyond three digits for this uh, example here. So great, so I'm going to run this, and uh, uh, we have, I don't know why I have that message here. Okay. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to figure out what exactly what that message means and, and why it's even there because I don't know why it's there. Nevertheless, moving on. Uh, so here we have the actual uh, estimation for this. So we can see we have a, a slope coefficient of 2.667. We have a constant of 3.963. So our constant is rather high. Um, it's nearly four, and we kind of define that to be three. So that's kind of awkward. Um, that random component here that we've added here uh, that has a mean zero and a standard deviation of three, this is adding a lot of additional noise to this underlying relationship that we kind of uh, arbitrarily baked in, if you will, since we, we imposed this from the very beginning. Uh, this random component happening here and this random component happening here within our X data, this is really uh, pulling uh, pulling these parameters in different places. So 2.6 is clearly not 3. 3.96 is clearly not 3 either. Uh, and so uh, our limited number of observations kind of uh, is, is imposing uh, some degree of, of additional noise uh, into this process. So uh, let's redo some of this, if you will. I'm going to take, uh, take these uh, chunks and I'm going to copy them again so we have them. And I'm going to put them down here. And I'm going to just leave the numbers. I, this is probably not proper coding. I'm going to leave all of these names the same. But uh, I'm, in this case, I'm going to just increase this by 200. I'm going to leave everything identical. The seed, everything, all of this is the same. Uh, rerun this. And then rerun our plot so that you can compare the plot. Clearly we have more observations, uh, but this rotates our line a little bit more. It bring, it's bringing it much closer in line with three uh, as our intercept happening down here. And it's also bringing it much closer to three in terms of a slope. So you can compare these two uh, directly. You can see how this uh, intercept is, is much closer to five here. Uh, it's it's considerably different in the slope. It's not nearly as steep. Uh, and so maybe when we rerun our model, we get a slightly better fit. So I'm gonna copy this as well, but I'm gonna change some lines on, on the, the model portion of this. And redo our preview so it hangs out there. Yeah, I'm gonna call this model two. And then here, I'm gonna put model two in as well. So with the Stargazer package, I can specify multiple models hanging out here. Uh, and, uh, and then it'll, it'll actually print them both. 
probably still yeah I'm going to still get that that uh, message here I figure out how to change that uh, and so now when we rerun this new model with the additional observations that we had before uh, we could see okay yeah we get much more closer in line to our our original uh, baked in um, relationships our our slope term is three uh, and, and much closer so for coffee and then our intercept is also much closer to three as well uh, so we can still see the the impact of the amount of randomness that we built in uh, to our underlying data so, but this this kind of helps to, to really motivate, like I said, our, our discussion of linear regression analysis and why we use it. In economics, we have a whole bunch of relationships. Uh, you start in principles of econ discussing relationships. We talk about demand curves and supply curves. These are mathematical relationships. How do we determine how uh, responsive or the uh, the point elasticities or, uh, or or the actual underlying relationships? Uh, think about a consumption function from principles of macro where uh, the amount of consumption that's happening on a national level is a function of income or particularly after tax income. Uh, we can we can specify these relationships, a Phillips curve relationship. You get the idea. I, we could go on and on and on and on. How do we determine how sensitive uh, these relationships are? Well, we use basically statistical techniques like regression analysis. Linear regression has some problems. We're going to talk about those problems, and we're going to get into why they're they're problematic, and and we're going to fully see a whole bunch of examples of, of the the violations of our assumptions of linear regression analysis uh, as we move on forward with other data, and we're going to possibly look at some solutions for those. At the end of the day, though, we need linear regression analysis as our jumping off point, as our starting point. Rarely is linear regression the end result. Most of our modern day economic research is using some variant of linear regression, but we need linear regression to give us that nice firm understanding of exactly what we're dealing with. This notion that we can have a marginal change in X, in this case the number of coffees, and we can then specify, okay, what is that change then uh, in terms of the actual number of hours that an econ student can study. Uh, so great, so with this information, we're gonna take this and this is gonna be our jumping off point. This is gonna be our starting point. In our next uh, video, I'm gonna to start to disentangle some of the math behind this. And we're actually gonna derive these OLS estimators uh, and go from there. And so you're gonna get the, the fun uh, exercise of seeing that whole optimization problem in uh, in detail and we're going to go through through all the equations and it's going to be a lot of good fun anyway uh, until then uh, take care